Click, click. There we are. Hey, everyone. I'm going to give it a minute before I dive in, if that's OK. Um, can someone post on the chat or show up on the microphones if you can't hear me clearly? You're all good. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Curious if uh, you want to not be bored for the next minute or two to post uh, in the chat what your what inspired you to join the session, what you're interested in. Curious. See none. You're just here to just here to see. That's cool. That's all right. Ba, ba, ba. Well, um, I think people will be able to catch up if they join. Um, just as a flag, uh, this session is billed as an interactive. It's sort of half and half. Uh, I think there's some context setting that's necessary. It's probably true of most interactive uh, sessions, but there's some context setting that's necessary that I'll be doing sort of at the beginning, telling you a little bit about the story that I went through. So you have a, so, uh, something to follow. And then at the end, um, hopefully there'll be lots of time. <laughs> Thank you, Patsy. Um, Patsy's procrastinating by watching this. Um, so hopefully there'll be time at the end to sort of explore some of the things that I've done on your own sort of wicked problems, your own personal wicked problems. Um, and with that, uh, just to be clear, if you aren't in the session, or if you are not looking for the session, I am Wicked Problem 2, then you're in the wrong place. Uh, you've been confused or bamboo bamboozled by the Zoom events lobby all over again. Uh, so you need to go back out and go find uh, the right place. Um, but if you are looking for this session, congratulations. Um, you managed to figure it out. Um, and today we'll be talking a little bit about uh, sort of a concept that we throw around a lot in systemic design, Wicked Problems. Um, I'm not going to go through the details, but Whittle, Riddle, and Webs, Web, Riddle and Weber came up with the this concept of wicked problems. I think it was in 63, and we've been sort of throwing it around in a lot of fields ever since, this idea that there are some problems in the world that aren't um, uh, easy to attack for a number of different reasons. They, um, For instance, there are no true or false, let me see if I can point directly, there are no true or false solutions, uh, there's no trial or error improvement, there's no particular set of solutions, looking way up there. And so wicked problems are things that we talk about a lot in systemic design, right? We focus on them um, around the tables when we are invited to support solving all kinds of complex problems. Uh, and yet, uh, at one point in my recent life, I looked in the mirror and I saw a wicked problem myself. Um, and so uh, I'm going to tell you, if you'll allow me to, to get cozy here, going back next to this cozy fire, you can sit on the rocking chair if you'd like. And I'm going to do a little bit of storytelling. Um, and hopefully you'll, you know, either learn what not to do, or maybe learn something you can use maybe later in this session. So the story that I'm telling, I'm going to be talking a little bit about procrastination, right? Gap procrastination is a gap between intention and action. It's when you needlessly and uh, voluntarily delay doing something that you know you need to do, or you know you want to do, um, in spite of knowing that procrastinating, uh, is harmful, in spite of knowing that delaying and not doing the thing that you intend to do is harmful. Um, it's a well-documented sort of phenomena. Lots of people experience it, um, and I've been experiencing it for a long, long time. Um, I remember sort of getting out of high school, getting into university where I was first really challenged and just like sort of failing a bunch of courses and not doing some of the things that I set out to do. Um, and my life is, you know, full of uh, objectives not met and projects not shipped because I procrastinated because I didn't attack things. Uh, and I spent a lot of time sort of banging my head on the desk, just sort of stuck and not sure why I wasn't able to fully execute. So over the course of many years, I tried, um, or, or sorry, before I get there, as I was exploring many of these issues, um, I became a systemic designer. And I remember attending this talk in 2018 from Dan Lockton um, about knots and double binds, about the idea that um, we can experience some knots in our lives that sort of are systemic in nature, that get us tangled up in ourselves. Uh, and he challenged, at the end of that talk, he challenged us to um, help people identify knots in their own lives and help them untangle them. Um, and he wondered, of course, is it even possible to untangle these knots? Um, and so that was a cool presentation. I remember seeing it, I think it was in um, Torino uh, in 2018. Um, and I thought it was cool. You know, I'm a systemic designer, it's a good challenge. It was a fascinating talk. The book that he sort of based that on is from a, a poet slash 
philosopher slash psychologist named R.D. Lang. I had a copy of it that I've lost, which is not in and of itself, but it's a beautiful book visualizing all these sort of common issues that Lang saw as a psychotherapist in people. And it just really enforced this like cool idea that, um, you know, there are knots in our own lives and uh, we can maybe think about them in terms of systems. And yet, you know, I'm a systemic designer, but I'm also an idiot. So I kept procrastinating, right? I kept doing all kinds of things, trying different uh, um, progress or product productivity systems and focus apps and to-do lists and time tracking and all kinds of different tools that just sort of never quite unlocked that root cause, never quite solved that problem. And these were the first sort of two phases of my procrastination life. Um, the first phase, I sort of brute force and ignorance through uh, my university, uh, early university career and sort of pulled all nighters and got through it that way. As the second phase uh, progressed, I started to try to get intentional about using cool tools in order to solve these problems, um, never quite getting there. And then in the third phase, uh, I became a dad. Um, and I realized that as I was becoming a father, uh, many of the sort of band-aid solutions that solved these problems for me uh, in the end, um, pulling all nighters, going into lockdown and just like shutting down and avoiding people, including my wife, uh, while I worked on a final project uh, and sprinting at the end of a deadline, you know, spending all of my time uh, day and night at the projects I was working on. No, those things weren't going to be an option anymore once I had an, an infant or a, a toddler. Toddlers are even worse, my goodness. Um, now I have two for the record. Um, but I realized I sort of, I, I entered into this third phase where I realized that all of the tools and techniques that I've been using, all the brute force and ignorance, they weren't working anymore, um, uh, or they weren't going to work anymore. I wasn't get, going to be able to rely on those kinds of um, Hail Marys in order to get through. And so I remembered all of a sudden this quote or this idea from Dan Lofton, could we help people identify the knots in their own lives and help them untangle them? Is it even possible to untangle these? And I asked myself, could I help myself identify this knot in my own life and untangle it? And is it even possible to untangle this? And so I got to work. I uh, sat down using my systemic design tools and techniques and started to try and model and map and work on these problems. And I ended up coming up with a model when I first sat down that looks like this. And I can post a link to you um, so you can play with it yourself if you want. Uh, fun side story, this actually hit the top of Hacker News, if you're familiar with it. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's this sort of weirdly named tech-ish social network. Uh, where people post headlines and then talk about them. And it's very Reddit style, but it's very, very, very um, high traffic. And so when this link got posted to Hacker News, I got emails from um, the CEO or the founder of Kumu, which is the tool that this is used, saying, hey, <laughs> the, the um, traffic has shut down um, Kumu. Can you sort of embed this in a better way so that we're not crashing with the improperly embedded traffic that I had used to, or improperly embedded link that I had used to share this? So, you know, it, it caught some traffic. It was pretty cool. That's not the real point. Um, the point of this is that I sat down, I sort of used systems tools to map out what was happening to me as I procrastinated. And I realized, and you can see it there, um, the, the big red letters, that anxiety was actually kind of at the core of this, that there's this engine that drove me when I started to work on things that um, caused me to feel a lot of anxiety. And the more anxiety I felt, the more overwhelmed I got, and the more overwhelmed I got, the more anxious I got. And that continued in a loop and just sort of shut me down over and over and over again. And that was a fascinating discovery because it was the first time that I'd ever realized that anxiety was a problem I could have at all. I would not characterize myself as being like um, debilitatingly anxious. And this isn't a talk about dealing with severe kinds of mental health disorders. Um, you know, you have my sympathies if you're if you're dealing with those. I certainly have had, you know, my share and dealt with many family members who've had my share. This isn't really a talk focused on that level of severity. It's a talk about bad habits and about feelings and emotions and how these kinds of things get anchored into loops in ourselves and our bodies. And maybe we can use these tools that we practice in the field in order to draw these out in ourselves. Um, so this was the first lesson I had in the use of systemic design in order to solve ourselves as wicked problems. It Modeling could be a kind of diagnostic. Never before had I realized the role of anxiety in my procrastination troubles. And that was a key insight because I could then work with that. I could engage a counselor and I did. Over the course of six months, I worked with a wonderful counselor 
who, you know, walk me through a variety of different techniques and tools and therapies, um, the details of which don't really matter. But as I learned, I worked with her to build up a new model, to take that original idea that I had just shown you and try to refine it with some of the other mechanics um, and dynamics at play here. Uh, and so the end result is a lot more complex. Um, I'm not going to walk you through it in detail, but again, I'm happy to share the link uh, after I'm finished speaking so you can poke through it on your own time. Um, there's a lot of sort of extras here about how Kumu works and um, how to explore um, models and visualize models and so on. But some of the key things I think that you might want to pay attention to are the idea that, or, or is the idea of uh, leverage analysis, these features at the bottom that you can't, my mouse isn't working, these features at the bottom, um, leverage anchors, bottlenecks, signals, tangles, etc. that came from my work uh, with Peter Jones. And I was able to use those in order to develop um, some new strategies for dealing with procrastination. Um, and so this was the second major finding about uh, using these tools on ourselves or on myself. Um, modeling can be a way of developing systemic strategy to deal with these kinds of knots and um, double binds. And so what I found, for instance, was that a key breakthrough event um, in, oh no, I got to hold on, fix this. Um, a key breakthrough event uh, in this model, um, which is a term I use to describe things that I can actively do that might help break through the cycles that sort of freeze me, is right here. It's this idea of intentional engagement in regulating. Um, and there's a variety of different ways, as you can see, that I can engage directly in um, intentional engagement. Uh, and one of them is reframing situations, um, trying to look at where I am and reframing it to be a more useful in a, in a more useful light. Um, and so one of the ways that I can do that uh, is actually through looking at the model itself. So this is a bit recursive. But the third kind of finding that I had about using models in this kind of way is let's see if this works here i am hi there i am hi um i actually have this printed out on my desk and so um i printed out like on on my counselor's advice many and many months ago and i sort of when i'm getting stuck again when i'm starting to feel overwhelmed i can actually find myself this becomes a wayfinding tool i can find myself in this map and so i might see for instance, that I'm feeling overwhelmed, and that's right here. And I might wonder, okay, well, why am I why am I feeling overwhelmed? Sure, it's all of these things, but which of them in particular is really bothering me right now? Is it that I am um, really, really digging in on whatever kind of stress I'm feeling about the project that I'm working on right now? And why is that? And I can sort of start to ask those questions, and that helps me execute on that idea of reframing, of finding myself in the in the system, or or at least finding the system in me and starting to see how this could be untangled, how trying to find those breakthrough events that might help me attack this issue in bigger detail uh, or in, in better detail rather. So that's sort of a walk through, oh, and I should sort of underscore that, that's the third finding of the work that I've done is to find that modeling itself can actually provide a kind of weird therapeutic device because once you've got that model and it renders your behaviors and your problems in, uh, sort of a real form that you can play with and interact with, um, you can use it to ground yourself and sort of figure out what's happening in real time, or at least near real time, reflectively, um, in order to try and work it out uh, and figure out how to move forward. So that's three total sort of uses of systemic design in trying to um, help work through knots in ourselves. Diagnostic, obviously, um, strategy is the second one. And then third is to use the model itself or what you create as therapy. I should flag that I've shown you causal loop diagrams modeled via Kumu. It's not the only way to do this stuff. As we know, you know, you can body storm systems, you can um, do rich pictures, you can um, simply have a really good conversation. There are many, many ways of modeling systems and working with systems. So you don't need to use causal loop diagrams in doing this kind of work. Um, but it, uh, whatever you use, I think there are ways of sort of playfully, reflectively, and, and self-directedly exploring how we are wicked problems. Um, so again, just to underscore, this is not medical advice, um, but I'm shifting now into the more interactive component of this session. Um, and I'm curious if we can explore this ourselves, uh, in this group, um, so I'm going to encourage, I'm going to take, a, I'm going to explain a little tiny bit more and then ask us to take a few minutes and sort of sketch on our own. And then hopefully we can come back and share some of the things that we're thinking about or talk about whether this is all BS and um, I'm a hack and I should go away. Uh, you know, I'm open to all of the 
possible um, outcomes here. Um, but just think to yourself, go back to the boardrooms that you've been in and think about the kinds of things that you've um, sort of shown uh, boardrooms or presentations or what have you. And think about the tools that you've used and shown. Is it causal loop diagrams? Is it rich pictures? Um, maybe it's the iceberg model that uh, sort of gets thrown around. Whatever it is, this isn't an interactive that's focused on teaching those specifics. And we can, like in the chat, we can talk through some of the ways in which we, um, uh, some of the tools we can apply if you want. Uh, as we go through the interactive component here, I'm happy to sort of feed some ideas in. Um, and I'm sure everybody else in the room has different ideas that they can add as well. But the goal, I think, of this is to, if you're going to participate, take a couple minutes and think about those different tools that you might use and try to think about a problem that you've experienced recently, a behavior that you like want to get rid of or a bad habit that you're trying to work on or a good habit you're trying to encourage and, and develop. Um, and try to think about, you know, let's use that iceberg model to um, sort of um, demonstrate, think about, you know, what is happening? What is the particular thing that's bothering me about this or that I want to make better? Um, why has that been happening? What are the trends and patterns over time? And then what is the system structure underneath that? Can you quickly and playfully and reflectively sketch out something that sort of teaches you about the wicked problems that um, you're trying to think about and think through that you're experiencing? There's a few other sort of components here that um, maybe you want to think about the leverage points that could be at play or the, um, the a way of modeling this as a rich picture or as I've suggested as a causal loop diagram or whatever. But the point is to let's take a second um, and to, to explore this on our own. Um, maybe before we shift straight into that, I'll pause. I, I haven't offered a chance to ask questions or comments yet, so I'll uh, open the floor for, for comments or questions, and then I will encourage us to take five minutes and sort of explore this on our own and see what happens. So any chat or, uh, or microphone-based questions before we dive in? I don't know what's happening behind me. What is that? That's my shelf. It is October, so it could be Halloween. 